Welcome learners. Today we will be talking about risk and insurance, essentials of insurance contract and peculiarities of insurance contracts. Last session we had discussed about the nature of insurance, principles of life and general insurance. So let us today understand what is risk and insurance and what are its essentials and peculiarities. Let's talk about understanding risk. Risk is the possibility of occurrence of loss. It is an unfavorable deviation from the expected, creating a sense of loss, which may or may not be measurable in terms of money. Worry, insecurity and uncertainty are all negative factors which adversely affect the output or performance of individuals. Risk with its resultant insecurity has an economic and psychological cost. And insurance provides a means for reducing the adverse impact of unexpected losses and lessen the worry factor. So having discussed about risk, it is now pertinent that there are certain key terms which need to be addressed here. When we talk about risk, it is an unexpected, unfavorable condition. So there is an uncertainty which is involved. There is a risk involved which is in monetary or non-monetary aspect. So when we talk about non-monetary aspect, there are various costs which are non-monetary in nature. These can be time cost, energy cost, psychological cost like the cost related to worry, anxiety, fear, tension, etc., which cannot be quantified in monetary terms. So risk comprises of all these economic and psychological cost. And what is the role of insurance? The role of insurance is to reduce the adverse impact of these costs, which are monetary and non-monetary losses. Having said that, let us now talk about the sources of risk. Now the factors which cause or contribute towards the occurrence of loss or the extent of loss are referred to as the sources of risk. And these can be classified into two factors which are perils and hazards. Perils cause the deviation in events from those that we expect and these are the immediate cause of loss. So how do I explain that? Peril is the ultimate result or the outcome which is the mishap which we can say and it is the immediate cause of loss. Suppose if I have to give an example then I might say that uh, it can be a natural peril, it can be a man-made peril etc. An earthquake, a landslide, a tsunami are all examples of perils. A cancer, a, a lung infection, a heart attack are all perils. So what, I, what do I mean by the peril is that it is the immediate cause of loss which leads to the financial or the non-financial loss. Now having talked about the perils, let us now understand what are the natural, man-made and economic perils. When we talk about natural perils, it is something like a misery and unexpected phenomena like I also discussed about uh, the loss arising due to earthquakes, landslides, tsunamis are all natural perils. When we talk about man-made perils, it is the outcome of our society or unethical practices of people like riots, strikes or any malicious damage. Accidents, thefts are also related to man-made peril. And there are economic perils which are cause of risk in economic nature. Depression due to, you know, uh, the economy not going up, there is a slump in the economy, there is uh, low production and unemployment, inflation and local fluctuations which cause instability are examples of economic perils. Having talked about perils, let us now move ahead and talk about what are hazards. Now, while perils are the direct cause of loss, hazards are the underlying factors which increase the probability of occurrence of loss. So, when I say that working as an electrician is more hazardous occupation than that of a banker is something which is related to an hazard. Similarly, a pilot who is 
you know, flying an aeroplane has a more hazardous occupation vis-a-vis -a, -vis a office worker who is sitting in a chamber and working on his laptop. So these are certain hazards. So when I say hazard, it is basically a situation or an underlying factor which is increasing the probability of occurrence of loss. So if I have to compare peril and hazard, I can give an example saying that smoking is a hazard which leads to cancer or a lung infection which is the resultant peril. So let us discuss some of the physical, moral and moral hazards. A physical hazard could be something like storing an inflammable material or a petroleum product in the premises of a cracker making unit which can lead to some explosion or fire accident in that place. There can also be moral hazard like cheating or fraudulent practice, dishonesty which is exist, exhibited by any employee or a trader you know arranging for a robbery of his own store and thereby trying to claim an insurance for the damage. There can also be moral hazard like attitude of lack of concern about the outcome of these actions. A careless person throws a you know cigarette maybe into an inflammable substance without any knowledge. So these are certain examples of hazards which can lead to lot of lot many amounts of perils. Now let us discuss about the types of risk. When we talk about risk which is the probability of loss, we can categorize the risk into various categories. First is the pure risk. In pure risk there is only a chance of loss and there is no probability of making a profit or gain out of it. For example, a person purchases a property, he is exposed to the risk of damage or loss to his property due to the fire. So this is an example of pure risk. When we talk about speculative risk, it is a risk where the chances of risk of either gaining or losing both exist. For example, you put your money in the share market, the value of a property may increase or decrease based upon the circle rates of the real estate or may be based on the locality amenities being increased. So this is a speculative risk because there is also a chance of making a profit out of it. There can also be personal risk which involves risk of you know premature death, death sickness, disability, unemployment and also the dependence and old age having a direct impact on the person. These are risks which affect a particular individual and hence they are categorized as personal risk. There is also property risk which is a loss to an asset such as damage to a building due to fire or damage to a vehicle in an accident or theft of vehicle where the risk is on the property or the asset which is of concern. We also talk about liability risk which is a risk of becoming legally bound to compensate or to pay for the damage to the person or property of others. Now what does it mean? As a professional we are in charge of lots of public or the person's health or wealth. For example, a banker is liable, liable for the public's wealth. Similarly, a doctor is liable, liable for the patient's health. So just in case a surgeon you know op operates on a person and he makes a mistakes in the surgery then he is liable for that operation and in case there is a loss to the patient because of the surgery or the operation then he is liable to compensate that patient. Similarly, we can take an example of a chartered accountant who is giving a wrong financial advice to his customer and the customer thereby ends into a loss situation. In that case, the chartered accountant is liable to pay a compensation to his customer. And in that sense, we have lot of liability insurance products available these days to protect those professionals against those compensations. Having discussed about the types of risk, let us now understand who faces risk. So when we talk about family risk, there is a personal risk which is caused by death, disability, retirement, unemployment of earning ahead. And these are various risks which a person is exposed to as a family. For example, there is a death, death or disability, the earning capacity of the individual goes for a toss and the family has to suffer. Similarly, there can be also property risk like a vehicle gets stolen or the saving uh, of the family gets crashed in stock market 
or a house gets destroyed in storms. In all these cases, the property has suffered a loss and the family in turn suffers the loss due to it. Similarly, we can take the example of liability risk where a family member has to compensate a victim suffering due to his negligence. For example, there is a person who is driving a vehicle and he has uh, committed an accident and there is an injury or damage to a third party, then the family has to bear the loss which is committed by the member. So these are the risks which, are, which a family as a, a group is exposed to in various situations. Now let us talk about the business risks and what are the various repercussions. Now in this case the magnitude is bigger than the family. So when I say the magnitude is bigger than the family here I am talking about the quantum of the claim. Obviously in business risk the claim amount is much higher than a family risk. Here when we talk about personal risk there is a death or disability of a partner or an important employee gets injured then again the business suffers losses. Similarly, when we talk about a property risk in business, there is a destruction of office building or machinery or the stocks are in fire or there is a storm or damage to the machinery or assets, then again the business suffers the loss exponentially. There is also liability risk in business like for example in family business or firms, they are also liable to others for bodily damage or property damage. Having talked about the various types of risks, let us now understand how do we handle these risks. There is various techniques of handling risk and first among them is avoidance. So how do you avoid risk? It is just to stay away from the risky situation or the problem. For example, if you know that a factory is going to start up in a place which is very uh, very proximate to the flood prone areas and there could be damage to the property, then what you can do is you can think about relocating the factory operations to some other place or you move to some other place. There can also be an example of maybe, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of threats to air crashes and, and hence you try avoiding traveling by air and choose an alternate mode of transport. So these are certain situations which are examples of how you can avoid risk. The next technique which can be used for handling risk would be loss prevention and reduction measures. So how do we do this? Here we are reducing, trying to reduce or prevent the losses which can occur in the future. For example, you have no smoking zones, sprinklers, fire extinguishers or theft alarms. So these days we have lots of such loss prevention techniques and even insurance companies give lot of claim benefits and they wave off lot of your premiums if you are employing such kind of techniques in your premises. So we have things like burglar alarms, we have safety equipments like fire extinguishers, you know, installed in our premises and which could be some of the loss prevention and reduction measures taken for handling risk. We can also have risk retention. So what do we mean by risk retention? It means that small losses which may occur frequently may be observed by the firm as normal operating expenses by creating an insurance fund to pay losses. So it is like an earlier mechanism which used to exist many years back where people used to accumulate fund for a contingency situation which might arise for example a death of a family member or some mishap in the family so that they can retain that risk by taking or pulling up funds from that source which is a contingency fund or a insurance fund kind of a thing. The last technique for handling risk is transfer of risk. What do we do in transfer of risk is basically like taking up an insurance plan where the risk is transferred from the insured or the customer to the insurer or the company. So here basically what you are doing is outsourcing a hazardous manufacturing process to someone else. So here the risk is borne by someone else and and it's quite obvious that when you are transferring risk, there will be a consideration or a fees which you would be paying to the insurer for bearing that risk. Having talked about risk, let us now understand what are the essentials of insurance contract and peculiarities of insurance contract. 
Now, for an agreement to exist or a contract to operate, there would be certain conditions which both the parties have to abide by and let us look at those conditions in an insurance's perspective. The first peculiarity or the essential of an insurance contract would be offer and acceptance. So what does it mean? In life insurance, there will be an offer which is made to the customer or the customer making an an offer to the insurance company and the other party has to accept that offer. So the offer could be in terms of the sum assured which the customer is wanting or the premium which the insurance company is uh, wanting the customer to pay. So these are the offer which either of the parties make and the other has to accept. So when I say that I want an insurance plan of say 1 crore sum assured and the insurance company says that you have to make a premium or pay a premium of 10,000 or 20,000 per annum, then these are the conditions or the offers which either of the parties are making and the other has to accept that offer subsequently for that contract to operate. When the offer is made and it is accepted by the other party, there is a consideration involved. What do we mean by consideration? Consideration is the premium which the insurance company charges for bearing the risk from the customer's end. So when the insurance company is taking the risk from the customer on itself, then obviously it will be charging you a fees, it will be charging a fees from the customer and this fees is referred to as the premium or the consideration. The third essential for an insurance contract is legal, legal capacity to contract or competency. Now what do we mean by this? It means that for this contract to become operational and valid, it should be legal or the person should have legal capacity to contract. So we cannot have a kid entering into a policy or buying a policy. There are certain conditions which explain the legal capacity. So the person buying the insurance or the proposer should be 18 years of age, he should be an adult, he should be of sound mind. And he should not have been involved in any criminal case or he should not have any criminal background. So having defined the legal capacity to contract, the next essential becomes consensus ad item. This means that the understanding between the insurer and the insured person should be of same thinking and they should be synchronized. It means that the message which I intend to transform should be perceived by the insured in the same way which I had intended. So if I say that your insurance premium is 10,000, then I maybe I had intended it to be 10,000 per month, but the insured or the customer perceives it as 10,000 per year. So this becomes ambiguous and it can, it can have many meanings. So what do I mean by consensus ad item is that both of us should understand it in the same way. So it becomes impertinent that I specifically mention the terms and conditions so that both of us are in consensus or synchronized. Having talked about consensus at Adam, the next essential for an insurance contract is legality of object. So what do I mean by legality of object? For the insurance contract to be valid, the contract must be for a legal purpose. And the principle which says that insurable interest is one of the principles for legality of objects comes into place now. Many a times it happens that the insured buys the policy for his personal use or a fraudulent purpose maybe to just channelize his uh, uh, fraudulent money. So it is essential that the purpose of buying insurance should be legal whether to protect your loved ones or your assets or property or whatever it is, but not to fund illegal activities. Let us now talk about the elements of special contract relating to life insurance. In life insurance, there are certain essential peculiarities which we should be aware about and we have already discussed that as well. The first one is at most good faith or abarima fights which says, that both the parties operate in terms of good faith. Now what do we mean by this utmost good faith and why is it important to insurance? Insurance when you compare it with other consumer goods or services, firstly there are two peculiarities to life insurance because it is a very long term contract which extends to almost decades. It can be one decade, two decades and even three decades long. 
so a contract or a relationship which is extending to such a large amount of time definitely demands that it should be based on a sound foundation of good faith and secondly insurance is a product which is intangible in nature and you cannot touch or feel it and you would come to know about its benefits only when the mishap occurs or the insured event happens which might take years together and the claim amount to be received by the customer so it is important that insurance contract operates on utmost good faith there should also be insurable interest between the parties now what do we mean by insurable interest insurable interest means that i should gain from the existence of the person or the property or i should suffer a loss because of the absence of the person or the property and this gain or loss should be in monetary terms and not in emotional terms so we had discussed what are the various cases under which we can have insurable interest and these are also laid by the court of law for example a spouse can take an insurable interest uh, for an insurance for his partner a parent can take a life insurance for his children and you can take life insurance for your business partners a creditor can take a life insurance for the debtor an employer can take a life insurance for the employee because in all these cases there is an insurable interest involved because of the gain or loss due to the existence or non existence of the person having talked about life insurance let us now talk about general insurance and what are the peculiarities in general insurance again we have utmost good faith principle applying which applies to both the parties we also have insurable interest which should exist at the time of inception and the claim and there is also a principle of indemnity which says that after the insurance the insured should be placed in the same financial position as he was before buying the policy now this only means that because of the insurance the insured should not make a profit out of the insurance so he should be placed only in the same position where he was existing so his losses should be compensated but he should not make a profit out of it and that's why this principle of indemnity does not apply to life insurance because you cannot estimate a human value you know you can approximately make a value for the human life being an income generating asset but there is an not an exact amount which you can quantify for a human life principle of indemnity also has certain corollaries where we have principle of subrogation which says that when the insurance company compensate the insured now the risk or the the power to take the claim from the other party having compensated the insured now the the risk or the power to get the compensation from the other party goes with the insurer there is also a proximity cause related to general insurance which states that insurance company will identify only the dominant and the direct cause as for calculating the insurance claim and we have discussed couple of examples where a personal accident claim can be of two situations there is a person who is lying on the ground because he was hit by a vehicle and there was no one to take him to the hospital and hence there in the cold he caught infection and died so in this case a personal accident claim would be given to the person but let us look at another situation where there is a person who was hit by a vehicle and he was taken to the hospital for treatment but in the hospital he got infection from other patients and died now here the death of the person is not due to the accident but due to the infection which he caught from other fellow patients and hence the insurance company had declined the claim so the insurance basis for claim payment will be decided on the proximate cause or the most dominant cause for the death or the insured event let us now understand the peculiarities of insurance contract now insurable interest is a prerequisite whereas in gambling the interest is limited to the amount to be won or lost so as i said there are a couple of differences which exist between gambling and insurance there is an insurable interest involved in insurance because 
you tend to suffer a loss because of the non existence of the property or a gain because of the existence of the property the insured is immune from the loss and his identity is known before the event whereas in gambling the loser cannot be identified before the event this is another difference which differentiates insurance from gambling full disclosure because of the utmost good faith is required from both the parties to an assurance contract whereas this is not necessary in a gambling contract as we already discussed we need to have utmost good faith which calls for a full disclosure and no misrepresentation of any material fact so when i talk about material fact it is related to any fact concerning the individual whether in terms of the habits his age occupation income which can have a detrimental effect on the risk of the individual and in resultant could be a variation in the premium so an insurance contract involves full disclosure of all these facts whereas in gambling there is no such full disclosure involved insurance contract is enforceable by the court of law whereas this is not the case with a gambling so these are certain points of differences which distinguishes insurance from gambling there are also other features of insurances which let us now look at them one by one first is aleatory insurance contracts are said to be aleatory which means that the values given by the parties are unequal now what do we mean by this when i say the customer is paying the premium to the insurance company and the company gives the claim in terms of the sum assured to the customer both these amounts are not equal it might happen that the customer pays the premium for just two installments and the customer dies and there is a mishap but and the insurance company has to pay the entire claim so when we compare both the va the values given by both the parties these are not equal and it might also happen that the customer pays the premium for the entire duration which can be 20 years and the claim doesn't occur at all so the company does not have to pay anything to the insured because the insured event has not happened but in that case we cannot say that the person has suffered a loss because he didn't get the claim amount the profit which the customer is getting or the benefit which the customer is getting is in non monetary terms because he is free from the worry of bearing that risk so in this sense we can say that it is aleatory in nature because both the parties are not paying the value equally the other factor is conditional the insurer is not obligated to perform if the conditions set forth in the contract are not met so if i say that the age has been misrepresented or the habits have not been disclosed then in that case we can say that the insurer is not obligated to perform the conditions because it operates on good faith and there was the primary condition for the insurance contract to be operational so if that principle has been breached then the insurer is not liable to pay the compensation in case of any mishap it is also unilateral in nature when we say unilateral it means that it is single directional only the insurer makes a promise to do something the insured on the other hand after payment of the premium does not make any promises so the contract says that i pay pay the premium and on the occurrence of the insured event the insurer will pay me the compensation so once the insured pays the premium his obligation ceases there now it is on the insurer to pay the claim or the sum assured or the benefit to the customer when the insured event occurs it is also personal in nature insurance contracts are personal which means that there is the loss to the person and not to the property itself that is insured so when i say that i am insuring my house or my car or my office so what does it mean of course the asset gets damaged and there is a damage to the property but ultimately the loss is borne by me so i am as a customer the person who is suffering the losses and hence it is personal in nature so having talked about risk and insurance the essentials of insurance contract and the peculiar peculiarities of insurance let us now try to summarize what does risk mean 
what are the essentials of contract and what are the peculiarities of insurance contract. I hope you have been able to have a good learning. Thank you.